Thank you for joining us for this Hagley History Hangout. I am Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer at the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library. And I'm being joined today by James McElroy, a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota. And we're going to discuss his dissertation project, which is called Racial Segmentation and Market Se Segregation, the Late 20th Century History of the American City Supermarket, 1960 to 1990. Uh, James, thank you so much for joining me today. Sure, it's a pleasure. Um, uh, just briefly, I'll introduce your project. Um, in it, uh, James offers a social and business history of the American supermarket that links the production and distribution of marketing knowledge with the shaping of urban spaces and communities in the latter half of the 20th century. And the process revealed is one in which market segmentation based upon racialized stereotypes informed the segregation of American urban space that we continue to live with today. Um, and once again, thank you for joining me, James. And my first question is, um, what collections uh, at the Hagley Library did you use to help conduct this research? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I would say that, um, you know, as your, your very good introduction uh, alluded to, um, my, um, my interest is really in, um, you know, how consumer markets became to be, came to be understood uh, by the grocery industry around the middle of the 20th century um, and uh, hopefully into the 1980s um, and how grocery shoppers came to be identified uh, by advertising and, and marketing professionals. Um, and so at, with my time at the Hagley, um, the papers that I was able to collect from Ernest Dichter um, really provided, I think, uh, a critical window into mid-century and 1960s era uh, research on consumer psychology, um, which over the course of my research um, on specifically the ways in which supermarket chains conducted uh, uh, market and consumer research over the course of my chronology um, is, uh, is really important. So Dichter is um, a really central figure in, in American advertising and marketing. Um, several historians uh, have written about Dichter. Um, he's uh, part of a, um, a group of uh, Central European emigres um, who uh, comes over um, and begins working in advertising um, through the 1940s and 1950s. Um, and he really introduces, uh, is one of the first to introduce um, psychoanalytical um, uh, techniques to uh, understanding uh, consumer behavior. Um, and it's, it's really sort of um, that uh, portion um, or that area of his uh, really sort of intellectual development um, and the ways in which he influenced uh, marketing methods and techniques uh, of, of sub subsequent periods that, um, that the, the, the papers that the Hagley holds for Dichter were, um, you know, really interesting um, and I think will form a really important part of uh, one of my early chapters of the dissertation. And so Ernest Dichter is known for applying uh, motivational psychology to, as you say, analyzing consumer behavior. Uh, how, how is that practice and the records kept uh, useful for you? Well, um, I, Dichter um, pioneers um, a method that's, um, that um, calls or becomes known as um, depth interviews or, or psychological depth interviews. And um, I had never um, um, heard of such, the, such a method um, until I, I stumbled across um, sort of a, a, another group of documents that related to the ways in which the Kroger supermarket chain um, was uh, or, or conducted research on um, the city of Cleveland in the mid 1960s, um, and so it was really about um, uh, and and Dichter's papers are really useful in sort of just excavating, um, you know, what um, how sort of um, psychological traits um, for consumers um, were uh, you know were, were sort of were sort of developed through this particular method, and so. You know, coming to sort of uh, Dichter's papers, look, wanting to be able to, you know, um, uh, ex you know, e explore uh, the met, you know, sort of learn more about his thinking and methodology, um, and the ways in which he 
you know, pitched and sold these methods to, to clients, um, and it, which included some supermarket chains uh, in the 1950s and 60s. Did he develop uh, psychological profiles uh, for types of consumers, or how is this information packaged such that, a, say, a, a supermarket chain could use it? Yeah, so he was um, uh, uh, sort of uh, came from a school that um, uh, wanted to develop consumer knowledge in ways other than um, through, you know, maybe more empirical demographic uh, research. Um, and so this is where the idea of um, uh, gathering sort of uh, groups of, of, of consumers, uh, in this case, mostly women who are, who are um, um, gendered as sort of the, the consumers at the grocery store over this period of time. Um, and um, uh, really um, establishing uh, focus groups um, and sort of asking, uh, asking questions and then sort of um, reading between the lines for sort of unconscious uh, unconscious motive, you know, unconscious um, stimuli for um, why uh, people, what drew people to, to particular products and particular brands. And, um, and this was a very, um, you know, th this, this interest, uh, uh, supermarket chains are, are very interested in sort of learning whatever, whatever they can about consumer motivation uh, uh, through, the 19, through the 1960s and really uh, adopted um, a lot of these sort of techniques and develop into um, what's known as psychographics, um, which is a very sort of influential uh, method which combines demographic and uh, uh, psychological attributes. Um, this is all really, you know, it sounds, it sounds really technical, but, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's where sort of tracking sort of uh, uh, these methods of sort of how, how consumers become categorized, um, I think is really important to, um, to, to my project and sort of how my project can speak to um, uh, the history of marketing more, more broadly. Was there a particular aha moment or a, a document as you were in the collections that really made you excited? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, there, were, there were several. So um, uh, the, 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 the first sort of report um, um, that I, that I, that I found, um, is, is a, um, uh, it was called, a, a, a socio physiological testing procedure, uh, for predicting reactions, uh, to a changed racial distribution of customers in, um, Hex, uh, Hex department store in, in Washington. Um, and this document was, was, and this, this report was submitted um, from Victor's Institute of Motivational Research, which is which he founds uh, around this time, the the mid to late 1950s, uh, and it was submitted to to the Heck Company in 1958. And so, seeing the ways in which, um, on the one hand, a, a very prominent uh, you know retailer is sort of um, uh, seeking um, and, and and sort of soliciting a marketing expert to sort of um, uh, make sense of, or, or, or provide a, a, a way to make sense of uh, uh, racial dynamics, um, you know, in, 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 in Washington, DC, or in their store, um, was very interesting to me at this, you know, at this moment. Um, and also, uh, the ways in which uh, uh, an institute, which is a marketing arm, um, you know, goes about conducting this research. And so, um, I was not expecting to find uh, um, something with, with so much relevance. Um, and I was, I was very pleasantly surprised that this was uh, a part of the collection. It seems uh, very specifically uh, uh, tailored to the nature of your project. Well, what, what does the report contain? What is its suggestion uh, to, uh, to the Hex retailer? Uh, it's, it, it, very, um, it's, it's very interesting in that I think it, um, it sort of vacillates on its uh, prescriptions. Um, I'd have to go back and take a much closer look at it. Um, I haven't been able to write about it um, um, in, a few, uh, in a few months. I've been uh, sort of teaching over the summer. Um, but 
uh, you know, very, very generally, um, my, my, my interest is in the ways in which um, uh, sort, of, sort of race is treated as um, essential, right? Or, or as uh, an, an explanatory force in and of itself for the ways in which um, you know, people behave in, inside of stores and outside of stores. And so, you know, it's really with that in mind and with sort of the particular, um, you know, um, uh, gender and class um, 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 assumptions, you know, that are really sort of underlining the report that are sort of int I'm interested in. And um, I'd have to go back and look at it more closely, but I, 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 I think it, um, um, you know, draws a distinction between um, the black middle class in, in Washington, D.C. and the black working class, um, which is a distinction that by the, 19, by the late 1960s, um, you know, supermarkets are not, um, are, are sometimes not drawing and, and are, are sometimes talking about black consumers as, as um, you know, as only um, uh, inhabitants of central cities uh, and not so much suburbs. And, and you know, we, we know that that's not the case. And so, um, uh, you know, I, I think this, um, you know, this document is really interesting in a lot, in a lot of ways. Yeah. It, it, it sounds like it. And, um, it sounds like, um, it's an interesting example of intersectionality before that term, uh, was used in, in common parlance or certainly even in the academy. Um, were you able to look at any other collections, um, while at Hagley for your project? Uh, yeah, I um, one of um, uh, the collections that I, I had not uh, uh, come to the Hagley uh, sort of anticipating uh, to look at, but which uh, Professor um, uh, Roger Horowitz, who I you know greeted me uh, when I first got to the Hagley, sort of tipped me off on was um, the, the collection of, of trade journals uh, from uh, Quick Frozen Foods, um, and uh, it's uh, Quick Frozen Foods is um, a, a, a trade publication for, uh, as it sounds, a, you know, the frozen food um, um, interest group or, or frozen food industry. Um, and so flipping through these journals, which I, I think were also um, digitized, um, so I, I could keyword search um, um, for specific terms, and that was very helpful to, to identify articles. Um, there's so much overlap in this time between, you know, the, the grocery industry and the frozen food industry. Um, and, you know, very often they're talking about markets in the same way. Um, frozen food is obviously trying to grow their presence in supermarkets and grocery stores, uh, you know, through the end of the 1950s into the 1960s. Um, and so the quick frozen food, um, you know, does a series of, of, of profiles in which um, you know, they're doing a lot of work, a lot of this similar work to what um, uh, the grocery trade publications are doing and, and sort of, you know, identifying different ethnic markets in different cities, um, speaking about sort of a, you know, a monolithic, uh, quote unquote, Negro market uh, through, the, through the 1960s. And so um, it's uh, not a, um, a source that I had uh, come to the Hagley expecting to uh, research, but um, was able to collect uh, quite a bit of art, quite a few articles um, from that trade journal, um, which was really, um, I think, really going to be quite helpful. Well, I think I've got, or you've given me a pretty good idea of um, where things begin in terms of your chronology. What then is the trajectory of your narrative um, you know, through the 70s into the 80s? How does this picture change? And um, how is um, the creation of marketing knowledge or information uh, related to those changes? Yeah, no, I think that that's, uh, that's a great question. And it's a question that, um, you know, I'm still working out as, um, you know, as I, as I research and write. Um, you know, in, in many ways, and with, for good reason, you know, the late 1960s and early 1970s are looked at as, a, you know, a key turning point um, in the history of um, supermarkets and cities. Um, you know, it, it, it's really during the 1970s uh, where you see um, a lot of the large uh, grocery chains um, 
you know, sort of consolidate, try to streamline um, during sort of, you know, a decade in which uh, there's sort of a severe economic downturn. Um, and it's, it's really during that period of time in which a lot of the regional and national chains sort of, um, you know, um, you know, sort of, sort of let go of their stores uh, that had been servicing uh, urban areas. Um, and so I think that that's, a, uh, you know, sort of, sort of telling that story, but telling it sort of in a, in a more complicated way than the conventional narrative um, uh, has typically told it, which, um, which if, you know, if I were just to, you know, broadly characterize the conventional narrative um, is that, you know, on the one hand, you know, there is a, a, a pretty powerful economic argument for why, you know, stores left cities. Um, and uh, on the other hand, there's also sort of uh, uh, narratives of, of, of that sort of um, are, are, are sort of full of, uh, are, are, are loaded with sort of explicit and implicit uh, uh, understandings of black deviance um, and this is sort of the, the, maybe the more conservative uh, narrative, which is that, um, you know, um, and, and obviously racist, um, which is to say that, um, you know, uh, these certain, certain city neighborhoods became too unstable for, uh, for, for supermarkets to, to understand that, um, you know, these are sort of markets worth, worth investing in um, and, and retail models uh, uh, where it's sort of look at, looking uh, areas in which sort of um, not to not to sort of innovate to, to try to, to try to service those consumers, um, and so I think I think sort of uh, uh, interrogating that interrogating those narratives uh, and sort of looking at the 1960s uh, in some sense in the late 1960s in some sense as a turning point, but also sort of situating it into a lar longer history in which you know on the one hand. Uh, in the early 1960s, we can already see this sort of um, uh, racialization, a process of racialization taking place within marketing and which is sort of informing the supermarket industry, right? Um, and then um, by the time you get to the end of the 1970s, um, psychographics, um, you know, continues and sort of continues to inform the ways in which large firms are, um, um, Thinking about markets, thinking about sort of, you know, what where what's profitable or to expand, um, and uh, by the 1980s, um, a lot of these large firms undergo uh, recapitalization or leverage buyouts, um, and became it becomes sort of, um, you know, streamlined with the ways a lot of firms were in the 1980s, um, you know, seeking to. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, seeking seeking to maximize sort of short, short term profit, um, and and you know, sort of ditching uh, unprofitable operations, which um, I think because a lot of uh, these racial tropes that are developed um, over the 1960s and 1970s um, areas become areas in which um, um, in which sort of pot potential might have been seen. Um, um, you know, it, they, they weren't. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's why I think that, you know, that, that's how I develop my idea, my sense of the chronology. Um, you know, I think that through the process of writing and, and drafting and, and getting feedback from uh, my committee and, and certainly more, more, more senior scholars who have, who have wrote around uh, or written around this time period, um, you know, that, that might be adjusted as I go. Well, it sounds a little bit like you're writing the prehistory of contemporary food deserts. Yeah, no, I think I think in a lot of ways um, the project is sort of informed by you know that um, by, the, by that concept, um, uh, which I think you know really develops uh, at the end of the 1990s um, and and early 2000s uh, and comes out of sort of a public health understanding, um, and I, I think that. Uh, rubric, you know, the, the sort of rubric of food deserts has been, you know, properly very critiqued um, um, by, you know, critical scholars, um, uh, more, more contemporary critical scholars who um, sort of reject the conceptualization of deserts as being, you know, being sort of empty um, and sort of also sort of what, you know, 
what, what, what race logics might sort of, the concept of a desert or emptiness might imply. Um, but I think, I think the, the, the question is, is, as developed in the early 2000s, is definitely one that enters the, enters the public conversation um, you know, about um, you know, uh, uh, certain cities. Um, and it was around that time that I, you know, began doing my graduate work and, um, you know, I, I was doing graduate work at the time where I, I was also working in a supermarket. And so, um, you know, the, this question of sort of food deserts, um, you know, what is a food desert? Um, you know, how, how did they develop, um, was one that I think has animated, um, my graduate work, um, from, from pretty early on. I think that came through in your research proposal um, because you mentioned sort of somewhat decentering uh, gro the grocery chain firm and trying to center community uh, involvement, community activism. Um, and so perhaps could you tell a little bit of that story? How is it that um, a community being poorly served by mid 20th century supermarket chains um, could to, could somehow organize to overcome that obstacle. Yeah, no, I think that's um, I think that's a great that's a great question, and I think that there are um, um, there are a lot of different answers in terms of um, you know the ways in which quote unquote underserved communities um, approached um, food and procuring food, and they they don't always or often look like um, starting sort of community supermarkets, right? And I think that there's a lot of work um, that's been done recently, a lot of great work, um, thinking in particular of uh, Asante Reese, his uh, work on black food geographies, um, Monica White's work, um, you know, that um, I think do really, you know, open, open up the conversation in, in really positive ways around, um, around sort of, uh, food and also sort of the ways in which um, black agency uh, uh, continues to happen even um, even though uh, certain communities are you know institutionally and, system uh, and systemically uh, neglected um, and I think th those narratives are very powerful um, my uh, because I'm sort of focused on supermarkets um, I'm interested in um, the in, in the ways in which communities, community leaders, business leaders, often sort of middle class, uh, sometimes clergy, um, uh, dedicated themselves to projects of starting community supermarkets. And this, this happens uh, really beginning in the mid, but mostly to the mid to late 1960s, uh, as uh, supermarket chains are leaving a lot of cities, a lot of cities with large black populations, um, Black neighborhood community leaders um, um, start ventures um, a lot of times with with sort of uh, the the public in the neighbors in the neighborhoods uh, buying stock um, uh, in in, a, in 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 opening a grocery store um, and 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 many of them many of them do open stores um, and there's there's um, sort of a regional uh, uh, I, there's an idea of having sort of a regional ch uh, uh, chain of, of black supermarkets in the 19, uh, at the end of the 1960s. Um, there are, are still black supermarkets that are, that are um, operated and are the legacy of this movement in places like Baltimore. Um, um, but so far my research, um, you know, sort of uh, talks about the challenges of, of many of these ventures. Um, you know, some of them only last a couple of years the stores, um, you know, struggle to, to stay open. They have disputes with their wholesalers and their suppliers. Um, you know, the, the, the neighborhoods, um, uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, feel, uh, uh, you know, accelerated effects of, of deindustrialization um, simultaneously as they're trying to, they're trying to start businesses. Um, and so it's, these these stories um, and and sort of this history of, of moment of, of of black supermarkets is both um, you know on on the one hand it's 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 a history that uh, not many people know about um, and it and it is another way in which 
um, uh, black communities responded to you know systematic uh, 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 deprivation um, in in you know really sort of creative and 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 and, and energetic ways. Um, and I think it's also a story of you know how hard you know what the limits of um, entrepreneurialism and and um, um, and, and, and small businesses are to um, urban problems, which are systemic in nature. And so um, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in, in sort of t t telling, you know, t t telling that story in sort of uh, a, complicated, a complicated way. Well, what is it like to conduct research at the Hagley Library? I had a, a really wonderful experience. Um, you know, I, I think um, it, it took it took a while, to, not a while, but I mean, it um, when when I first arrived, it, what struck me was sort of how how big the campus was, um, and um, and sort of learning sort of how to navigate the multiple sites, the multiple archives and libraries, and you know, kind of just figuring out where I needed to go and um, and um, and who to talk to, um, you know. But once um, you know, once I had those conversations with the archivists and librarians and, and, um, um, and, and the folks there, they made it um, very easy to find what I was looking for. Um, it's um, one of the, um, I think, really big benefits of, of researching at the Hagley are the sort of, um, uh, sort of on-site, online um, um, digital databases um, that you can access, um, um, you know, through, I guess, through the Hagley, Hagley Wi-Fi. Um, and that is actually where I, where I found a lot, um, of, uh, or I, I wouldn't say a lot, but that's where, um, you know, a lot of the Dictor stuff I was able to kind of just, you know, directly download, um, uh, the same with some articles from Quick Frozen Foods. Um, and so I, I'd say that that was, um, you know, as, as a researcher, um, that's a that's a big time saver, um, and uh, and yeah, no. In terms of the reading rooms are very nice. They're spacious. They're well air conditioned. So um, you know, of the places I've done research, um, Hagley's uh, near the top in terms of um, you know just amenities for a researcher. Well, I'm so glad that it was a productive uh, resource for you, and uh, we hope you stay in touch. And James, thank you so much for speaking with me today about your work. Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure. Likewise. Take care. Right, and uh, for the audience, um, thank you once again for joining us for this Hagley History Hangout. If you'd like more information about the program um, or the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society, or the Hagley Museum and Library, you can head to our website. That's hagley.org, H-A-G-L-E-Y.org. And thank you for joining us.